The next reading is from Matthew, chapter 7, verses 1 to 12. Do not judge, or you too will be judged, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And, the one, and to the one who knocks the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. So everybody today, thanks for coming out in the wet. Am I on? Am I on? Everyone hear me? I can see you, which is fantastic. <laughs> Bit of elevation. I feel so empowered. Um, there is a sermon outline in your notes there. Always good to take some notes. Let me uh, pray for us as we continue to look at God's Word. Thank you, Father, for bringing us together today. We thank you for your love uh, and your great mercy in our lives through your Son. And Lord, we thank you that in these few moments we can pause to consider your Word again. And again, we pray that Jesus' words might uh, touch our souls, feed us, Lord, and strengthen us in following Christ. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. Well, as we continue in the Sermon on the Mount uh, this morning, I wanted to begin by asking you to think about whether certain nationalities exhibit characteristics in their speech and behaviour which are identifiable, you know, on a broad scale. Uh, you might like to think about the characteristics of your particular ancestry or nationality. You know, sort of getting at the idea, well, are the French a particular type of people, or the Dutch or the Japanese? What do you reckon? You think about your ancestry... But I've done a bit of research into the qualities of Australians in broad terms and here's what I have discovered. See what you think of this. We Australians have a strong belief in fair play and a fair go. We're friendly and outgoing. Uh, we love a larrikin, someone who breaks the rules just slightly, but in a good humoured way. We have a strong sense of mateship. It's important to care for and look after your mates. We pride ourselves on being tolerant and non-discriminatory towards others. Uh, we have a strong sense of equality and hate class structure, a healthy scepticism of authority. We are known for our self-deprecating humour more than happy to laugh at ourselves. And we love the great outdoors and food outdoors, such as barbies, meat pies, picnics and the beach and so on. Well, I don't know if any of that resonates with you about Aussies, perhaps more legend than reality, you never know. We like the legend though, don't we? Um, but it's interesting to think about these things. But there is one quality for which I think Aussies are famous, and it's best summed up by that phrase, the tall poppy syndrome. You've all heard of that, haven't you? We are known as a very critical nation. We do enjoy a good put-down. Even if someone, through skill and hard work, is better than the rest of us, we feel it's our duty to cut them down to size just in case they might dare to think that they're better than the rest of us. And I'm sure having a negative and critical spirit is not unique to Australians, of course, but whatever nationality or heritage we have, it's not a particular strength of ours. And you've got to wonder, as we think about being Australians and Christians, whether that sits very well with what we've been looking at in the Sermon on the Mount, with Jesus' radical call to discipleship. Does having this critical spirit really appropriate for us as God's people? Well, that's what we're going to be thinking about as we look at this next section because Jesus, uh, as we heard in our reading, goes on to say, do not judge or you too will be judged. Um, so as we come to uh, Matthew chapter 7 uh, in our series, Jesus turns our attention to three 
very important relationships that we experience as disciples of Christ. Uh, the three of this in uh, chapters 7 verses 1 to 5, it's all about our relationship with each other, brothers and sisters in Christ. Verse 6 is a peculiar little verse but it's really all about those who oppose us as, as representatives of Christ. And then the last little section, 7 to 12, is really all about our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Well, let's look at each of those quickly. First of all, he addresses the danger of being judgmental with each other and he says, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now, it's worth asking, when Jesus says, do not judge, what exactly is he talking about? What does he mean? Now, let me suggest it cannot possibly mean to suspend all your mental faculties uh, in assessing a situation or a person. He is not saying don't make any judgment at all. Suspend all rational thinking. That's not what he's saying. And it can't possibly mean I'll turn a blind eye to other people's faults and pretend you don't notice them at all or never be drawn into a discussion about discerning what is true or what is false or what is good or what is bad. It can't possibly mean that. And we know that because if we jump ahead to verse 6, which we'll see shortly, Jesus speaks, there he talks about uh, dealing with outsiders. And then in verse 15, he, we are warned about false prophets. And we'll see it's clear in both of those examples, we need to make a judgment about people and about circumstances. So if Jesus is not forbidding every form of criticism per se, what on earth is he talking about here? Well, I want to say that the follower of Jesus can still be a critic in the sense of using our powers of discernment, but the difference is that we are not to stand in judgment of others. Now, there's an old-fashioned word that best describes what Jesus is talking about here, and I'll bet you've never heard of it before. It's called censorious. Who's heard of that word before? You've read old novels. That's the only reason you would have heard it. Well, this word censorious is to be a fault finder. It is to have a negative and critical spirit that seeks to be destructive and to tear other people down. Someone who is censorious seems to take great joy uh, in highlighting the failings of others. They see people's motives in their worst possible light and are ungenerous in their assessment of other people's failings. I wonder, does anyone come to mind? Hopefully not yourself, someone else surely, you know. But to be censorious is to set oneself up as the censor, that is the one who claims to know all and have all authority over others and the right to stand in judgment on them. Simply it's to be very self-righteous. And that is a dangerous thing to be because of what Jesus goes on to say. He says, in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. The measure you use, it will be measured, uh, used, sorry, used against you. Now in Jesus' day, there were some rabbis who said that God had two measures by which he measured people. One measure is the measure of justice, where you get what you deserve, and the other measure is the measure of mercy, where you don't get what you deserve. And it may be that Jesus has that in his mind as he's trying to drive home this point here. If we, are, if we critically assess others only through the lens of justice, then that is exactly how God will assess our lives and there will be no room for mercy or grace. Jesus says, do not judge, do not be censorious, do not assess others with a critical spirit and as people who have experienced God's mercy, we would be encouraged to view others through that lens of mercy and grace. Well, Jesus goes on and he says, do not be hypocritical. Now in these verses, verses 3 through 5, uh, he uses an example of seeing a speck of dust in your brother's eye and not noticing the massive plank of wood in your own eye. He then highlights the audacity of such a person to offer to take that tiny speck out of the other person's eye while being virtually blind or unaware of how their eye is obstructed with the other obstruction. Well, once again, Jesus uses exaggeration here to make his point. I mean, how ridiculous to think that someone who had such a massive obstruction in their own eye 
could be so self-unaware as to see and think they could take the small fault out of the other person. And that's the whole point here. It's a powerful illustration of what we are all so easily capable of. Uh, the story of King David and Prophet Nathan in 2 Samuel Samuel chapter 12 is a great example. I don't have time to look into that, but if you want to do that another time, it's a wonderful example of this very thing. John Stott, I'm a big fan of his, this is what he said at this point. We have a fatal tendency to exaggerate the faults of others and minimise the gravity of our own. We seem to find it impossible when comparing ourselves to others to be strictly objective and impartial. On the contrary, we have a rosy view of ourselves and a jaundiced view of others. It's painfully true, isn't it? It is so true. And some of us are very gifted at seeing the fault in everything. Why do you think that's the case? Why do we find it so easy to see the fault in others and not in ourselves? Well, I want to give three quick suggestions for us to ponder. The first one is we like to blame others. Ever since sin came into the world, we have been accomplished at blaming others for our less than perfect circumstances. Uh, so when uh, God has said to Abraham, Abraham, Adam, sorry, what have you done after eating the forbidden fruit? The blame game began. It's had a long history. She did it, Lord, you know, that terribly bad woman that you put with me. It's all her fault. What a weak man. But Eve wasn't left out. She goes, no, no, Lord, that terrible, naughty snake. It was all the snake's fault that you put here in their garden. They end up blaming God, don't they? See, the truth is that we are often critical of others because of some unhappiness in our own lives and we are simply looking for someone to blame rather than take responsibility for our own lives. Well, secondly, a critical spirit often flows out of our own insecurities. We're all frail, we know that, we're all weak, broken, we don't like to admit it too often, more insecure than we often care to admit or wish we were. However, by disparaging others or by putting others down, we have a sense of exalting ourselves and telling ourselves in some way that we're morally superior and we're okay. We don't do that, do we? Yeah, we do. The third reason uh, for why we are often critical is not because the other person has done anything wrong, but simply because they're different to us. It's amazing how threatened we are by others who are simply different. And because of that, we desperately want to find other people who align themselves with us, who are just like us. And when we do that, we tend to form a relational triangle, with the result being that the different person is clearly on the outside and it makes us feel so much better who would want to be on the outside i mean i don't know if this is your experience but for me it's so comforting to know that someone else holds the same uninformed prejudiced views as me isn't it comforting it's so reassuring not very godly though is it let's summarize what we've covered so far Jesus says we are not to play the judge in our relationships, we're not to be censorious and condemning in our assessment of others, not self-righteous. We're not to be quick to find fault, as if we are somehow superior, and nor are we to hypocritical, he says, where we blame others while excusing ourselves. As always, Jesus' teaching is clear, but how are we to attain such a high standard of relating to one another when our natural tendency is to be critical of others? Well, the answer, uh, Jesus says, is regular self-assessment. He says, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. I mean, that sounds like great advice. But how is that possible, even with the best of intentions, when we already know we have difficulty honestly assessing ourselves? Well, the simple answer is that we need to keep coming back to the gospel and the cross of Christ. That alone gives us the perspective to see ourselves as we should. 
That alone and nothing else will keep us humble and generous in our assessment of others. Because it will keep reminding us that we are sinners, all sinners, and we are sinners saved by grace and grace alone. If I can use a simple illustration, let's think of it this way. You know, it's like when you look at a painting and if you look at it up close like this, which isn't something we normally do if we're sensible, but imagine you do that, you, there's no perspective, is there? You really don't see what the painting's all about. But when we step back and we view it from a distance, as you cultured people here in Mossman know what to do when you go to the art gallery, of course that's what you do. You stand back and look at it and take it in, the brilliance of it all. But see, it's a bit like that with our own self-assessment. It is difficult to recognise what is going on in our own hearts and self-assess ourselves because we are looking at ourselves up close all the time. But when we look at ourselves and others through the lens of the cross, that changes everything. And that's a vastly different picture. We actually see our common humanity. See, only the cross of Jesus and his saving grace for sinners like you and me can possibly give us the perspective we so desperately need so that we will not delight in putting others down but instead rejoice in being generous and kind and seek to build others up. Only with our eyes on the cross can we hope not to be hypocritical and only because of the cross can we have a right assessment of ourselves as sinners saved by grace. But... Even when we do that, it doesn't abdicate us from our responsibilities to one another. Jesus still says we have the responsibility to take the speck out of our brother or sister's eyes because they can't possibly see it, but we can. And it's the loving thing to do. See, we need each other in this journey of radical discipleship that Jesus is calling us to. I mean, specks might be small, but they can be oh so irritating. Remember the last time you had something in your eye? What did you do? You went up to your husband or wife or someone and said, can you see what's, can you, can you get it out? Small, but we need others to help us, don't we? Friends, we are not called to be perfect in what Jesus is talking about here. But we, are, we can correct our brother and sister in Christ when we are meek. We're called to be meek. And meek people have a true estimate of themselves that is reflected in a gentle, humble and generous attitude to others. In our relationships with one another, Jesus says, do not be judgmental or you too will be judged. Well, he moves on in verse 6, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this, but this uh, is all about relating to those outside the kingdom. And Jesus says here that in relation to them, we do need to be discerning. In other words, a critical approach is actually essential. He says, Do not give to dogs what is sacred. Do not throw pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and then turn and tear you to pieces. Now, I don't intend to spend a lot of time on this verse, but it's because I think what is described here is rare on the whole in our experience and it's also a last resort at best. Now, when Jesus here talks about dogs and pigs, that's a, not a very a kind reference, I know, but it's to those outside the, the kingdom of God. And the pearl he's talking about, well, that is sacred, and that is talking about the pearl of great value, which Jesus describes in another parable, which is all about the gospel. That pearl is the gospel, the good news. And he is thus suggesting that we need to be very discerning with whom we share the gospel and how we share the gospel. He is suggesting that it was unwise to keep sharing the gospel with those who openly and persistently resist it. Now, it's an extreme example, but Jesus says to do so might ultimately endanger our lives in the same way, to use the illustration here, that wild dogs who are hungry and unsatisfied may turn on the unsuspecting stranger. Now, I suspect that the great danger for most of us is not in oversharing the gospel, not in oversharing our faith, but possibly in not sharing uh, the gospel at all. However, if you happen to find yourself in a situation where you're, you keep sharing the gospel with someone and they treat it and you with contempt, 
then I think that's what Jesus is talking about here. We need to discern whether it is time to move on and maybe share the gospel with someone else. Now, in my experience, and I suspect in yours as well, we need to be wise with whom we share the gospel and the good news of Jesus. And again, in my experience, and I suspect yours, there would be very few people with whom you could just wash your hands and say, okay, done, no more, and walk away, because they've been so aggressive in how they've responded to you. Well, we need to move on. We come to this next section where Jesus uh, talks about our relationship with our Heavenly Father and he warns us about the dangers of prayerful, prayerless discipleship. Look what he says there. Ask and it will be given you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks the door will be opened. So these verses are all about our relationship with our Heavenly Father and the need for prayer. You might remember earlier on in the Sermon on the Mount, back in chapter 6, Jesus gave us a pattern for prayer in the, the Lord's Prayer. And you might remember there's basically six things that he tells us to do there. We're encouraged, encouraged to seek God's glory, God's reign and God's will. And then we're called upon to ask for God's provision, God's redemption and God's deliverance in our lives. That's a beautiful pattern for prayer that we've been given there. But here in chapter 7, Jesus calls us to a prayer life which demonstrates a faithful, consistent dependence on God and a persistence in prayer. Jesus says, ask, seek and knock. Now each of these verbs is a present imperative which carries the meaning of ask and keep on asking, seek and keep on seeking, knock and keep on knocking. Now, I don't know if you can recognise the picture up on the screen there. It's from a show called Big Bang Theory. Anyone seen that show? Gee, at eight o'clock, two people. We've got at least six here. That's an improvement. Well, the guy in the red there is a guy called Sheldon. It's a sort of a geeky science show, if you've seen it. And there's a lady across the corridor from where he lives called Penny, and he goes off and knocks on her door all the time. He goes, knock, 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 Penny, knock, 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 Penny, knock, 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 Penny. It's hilarious. Believe me, even though it doesn't sound funny now. Um, and I thought that's just a classic picture of what Jesus is talking about here. I'm not really meant to badger God, like he badgers Penny, but it's similar. We've got to be persistent in our prayer because prayer is a practical demonstration of our relationship with God and our dependence on him. See, when we fail to pray, when we fail to be persistent in prayer, Guess what happens? We end up falling back on our default position, which is to trust in our own resources, which, as we know, are inadequate for the life that Jesus has called us to. And we've seen in the Sermon on the Mount how Jesus calls his disciples to live distinctive lives as members of the kingdom of God. Not easy to do. You remember, we're called to be poor in spirit, pure in heart, to love our enemies to be people of integrity, to store up treasures in heaven, to not worry, to not judge. Let's face it, on our own, we are powerless to live that sort of life, the life that we've been called to. So Jesus says, ask, seek, knock, and keep on doing it, and God will answer, and we will find if we seek, and the doors will be opened if we dare to knock. See, Jesus is calling us to a wholehearted pursuit of the kingdom of God. Uh, and in order to achieve that, we will need to be empowered by the Holy Spirit that God gives because on our own, we simply can't do it. And we have every reason to persevere, Jesus says. Not only because we're assured that God will hear us, but because he is good and he wants to bless us. I mean, Jesus illustrates his point with this uh, family-oriented parable. He compares an earthly father with our heavenly father. Now, having been an earthly father myself and knowing many other fathers, I know we often get frustrated with our children from time to time. But above all, we want what is absolutely best for them. I mean, most earthly fathers can't give their kids exactly what they want or everything they want, but they give them the best they can because it's for their good. So it is with God. But even more so, as Jesus says 
If you, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Think about it. God has all the resources of heaven at his disposal. And he can shower them upon us, his children. And he's not in the business of depriving his children. He delights to give them good gifts. We need to pause there for a moment and think, but it's important to notice that Jesus doesn't say our loving Heavenly Father will give us everything that we want or even that we ask, but He will give us those things we ask which are for our good. But if we are to receive even the good things, we still have to ask, we still have to seek and we still have to knock. Here's a quote that I like from John Stott. He says this, The reason why God's giving depends on our asking is neither because he is ignorant until we inform him nor because he is reluctant until we persuade him. The question is not whether he is ready to give but whether we are ready to receive. In prayer we do not prevail upon God but rather prevail ourselves on ourselves to submit to God. I want to suggest that perhaps one of the reasons why we struggle to pray effectively is because our prayers are focused on creation gifts or can I say material things and not on redemptive gifts or spiritual gifts. Let me suggest perhaps we do tend to focus on material things rather than the spiritual things and the kingdom of God. I mean Jesus did encourage us to pray for our daily bread but as we saw last week the primary focus for us is the kingdom of God which is why he commanded us to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Now what we might call the redemptive or spiritual gifts come to us by the power of the Holy Spirit and they are all about transforming us into the likeness of Christ. That is God's chief concern for you and for me and that should be the focus of our prayers. So we can pray for the material things, we can pray for a better job and better health and better this and that or that, improved relationships or whatever, all good things to pray for, not a problem with praying for them, but God doesn't promise to give us creation gifts or the material things, but he does promise to give us the redemptive gifts, the spiritual gifts, like peace and joy and faith and hope and growth in our likeness of Christ. Look at this example from Philippians chapter 4. It says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And what is promised? Peace. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. See, friends, God wants to empower us to live as faithful disciples. He wants to lavish good gifts upon us, like purity of heart, humility, love, joy, faith and hope. We simply need to ask and keep on asking. Which is why Jesus concludes this section with what is commonly known as the golden rule. It is the summary of how we are to approach all of the relationships we have. And so he says there in verse 12, Therefore, in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. In other words, when we live this way, it's not about earning God's favour, but rather acknowledging that this is simply the best way to live by far. There is no better way to live. It is God's way. Seen clearly in the cross of Christ where Christ did for us what we could not do for ourselves. When we do to others what we'd love them to do to us, Jesus says we fulfil God's word and we show the world that this is what it means to be a disciple of Christ. That's what it's all about. At the earlier service this morning, they had a hymn which I really love and I just want to read a verse to you because... It says this, Dear Lord and Father of mankind, forgive our foolish ways. Reclothe us in our rightful mind. In purer lives thy service find. In deeper reverence, praise. That's what we need to pray, isn't it? Forgive our foolish ways. Help us to not be so judgmental and critical. Help us to love the Lord Jesus so much that we share the gospel where it needs to be shared. 
but help us not to try to do it in our own strength. We need to come to our knees and keep praying that God would strengthen us by his spirit so that we can be the people he's called us to be. Let's pray. Oh Lord, your love for us is incredible. It is persevering, it is steadfast and faithful. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that in Christ we have confidence to know we are your precious children. And Lord, as your precious children, we want to live lives that bring honour and glory to you. Lord, we recognise Jesus' words are challenging and difficult for us. But as we think on today, Lord, we know we have self-righteous, critical hearts so often. Please forgive us. We want to be people who build others up, who see the good in them and point them to Christ. And so, Lord, help us to be people who come back to you on our knees in prayer day by day, knowing that we can't achieve anything without you and the empowerment of your Spirit. So thank you again, Lord, for all your goodness to us. Help us to trust you in these days. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. Sorrows, tears, my strength to cast out fears.